Hi, my name is Paul Matthews. Uh, I'm an investigator and co-director of the Neurotherapeutics Group at the uh, Lundquist Institute for Biomedical Innovation. I'm also an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at the University of California, Los Angeles. I'd, uh, appreci I appreciate the uh, invitation to speak today at the LabRoots uh, Neuroscience uh, Conference, and I am excited to tell you about uh, a novel ataxic mouse model of ataxia telangiectasia caused by a clinically relevant nonsense mutation that we've been working on in the lab. Now, ataxia telangiectasia is not only a mouthful to say, but it's also a horrible disease. It's rare, it's a multi-system disorder. Uh, it occurs in about one in 100,000 individuals. The telangiectasia uh, is basically bloodshot eyes or um, there's a constriction of uh, blood vessels and this differentiates it from many other types of ataxia. The ataxia is a loss of motor coordination that is arises from a neurodegeneration and particularly a selective neurodegeneration in the cerebellum. You can see here at five year old, in a five-year-old patient that that bottom area there uh, in between the two arrows, nice, relatively healthy cerebellum. But at 13 years, there's uh, a lot of loss of tissue and dysfunction of the cells within that brain region. And that gives rise to this loss of motor coordination as the cerebellum is a major center that is involved in this type of behavior. As I said, it's a multi-system disorder, um, and there are many other characteristic symptoms of the disease, including radiosensitivity, um, high predilection, uh, so immune defects, they're immunosuppressed, a high predilection towards cancers, in particular lymphatic types of cancers, and patients are usually sterile. The progression of the disease, well, usually parents begin to identify challenges uh, in their children around one or two years of age when the uh, AT children are unable to progress across their milestones, in particular that of moving from the toddling stage, as you see here, into a coordinated uh, walk. Unfortunately, it's a progressive uh, disorder, and that is, is that while the patients are able to walk um, and there's not a lot of changes up till five years of age, the motor coordination does begin to pro progressively decline. Uh, patients are usually in wheelchairs by their early teens, and unfortunately, patients die uh, between the ages of 10 and 30 years of age about a third from respiratory tract infections, a third from cancer, and then a third from major complications of the ataxia itself as eating and swallowing becomes um, particularly affected. AT is a genetic disorder. It's an autosomal recessive disorder. That is, is that both parents um, must carry at least one copy of the abnormal gene. And this means that AT patients are children who have um, defects uh, in the ataxia telangiectasia mutated gene, um, which is shown here. And it's abbreviated as ATM. Several different mutations have been identified, over 100. Um, and this includes nonsense, missense, deletions, and frame shifts that cause disruption of the ATM gene, leading to the loss of function of the ATM protein. The ATM protein is a serine threonine protein kinase. It's a huge protein, over 3,000 amino acids, has several signaling domains. Um, and given all of this complexity, it has also been in, implicated in a wide host of different um, cellular processes. This includes those from neurotransmitter release to mitochondrial metabolism, autophagy, uh, metabolism within glucose uptake. It's most well known for its role in DNA repair, in particular in re restoring or in um, initiating the repair of double-stranded breaks to DNA, um, and has also been implicated in gene regulation. So yeah, as you can imagine, loss of the protein with such a diverse set of um, roles um, is likely to cause a very diverse set of characteristic symptomology and unfortunately, at this time, there are no therapeutics or cures that exist. Care is generally, generally palliative, 
and the outlook for these patients is unfortunately bleak. The ataxia itself is the most penetrant aspect of the disease, while the cancer and the um, immune defects and infections that occur are diverse across the patient population. They all eventually are attack, ha gain ataxia, um, and it, uh, it is the one symptom that has the greatest impact on their quality of life, severely limiting it, putting them in a wheelchair, putting them bed bound. Um, and eventually causing death. The link between ATM deficiency and cerebellar ataxia is clear what the deficiency in the ATM protein does that specifically leads to a cerebellar um, degeneration and dysfunction. And um, what we've done recently is to create a new uh, clinically relevant mouse model of AT. This mouse model has a nonsense mutation that, is, that causes a premature termination codon. In particular, we inserted um, a mutation at um, codon 103 uh, that changed the C to a T. And in humans, this causes an R35X mutation. In mice, because the, the gene is a little different there, it causes a Q35X mutation, as we've shown here on the left. This mutation is, uh, is found in a large patient population in Northern Africa. Uh, the mutation, this nonsense mutation, causes complete loss of the ATM protein, as you can see over here on the right in the Western block. Across the top rows there, you can see these black lines. Each of those black lines is indicative of how much ATM protein is in the mouse. And as you can see, the R35X um, homozygotes uh, do not have any ATM protein, while there is a gene dose res response in those that have at least one wild type copy of the gene, you know, which you can see in the middle lane. Unfortunately, um, we hit a major roadblock, and quite honestly, it wasn't uh, unexpected. And the challenge is, is that ATM deficient mice do not develop ataxia. Of course, if we want to understand the link between ATM deficiency and that of ataxia, in particular the mechanisms that are leading to defects in the cerebellum, then we need a model that also replicates or recapitulates this. Uh, to give you just an, an illustration of this, um, I will show you a video of two mice on a vertical pole. On the left is a wild type, and on the right is a completely ATM deficient mouse. These mice are 400 days uh, age old, and you will see that there's really no difference in their motor coordination skills uh, at this age. So you could see that both mice were fully capable of walking down the pole. There was no problem. This is not a unique feature of uh, mouse models of uh, ATM deficiency. Several other uh, mouse models have been examined um, that are deficient in other DNA repair pathway proteins. This includes um, the proteins apertaxin, senataxin, MRE11, um, and TDP1. And while in humans, loss of any loss of expression of any of these proteins causes a, a toxic phenotype in mice, it does not. Here we're showing just a, an example of this. So this is a, on the left a wild type mouse, and on the right is an apertaxin or aptx knockout mouse. And you'll see that both mice are capable of walking down the pole without any issue. The aptx mouse is a little bit slower, but um, overall, they don't show any um, defects in their motor coordination. 
So what we decided to do was is to try to increase the genotoxic stress if the reason that the mice were, were able to overcome the loss of these DNA repair pathway proteins, maybe it's that their shorter lived lives um, allow for them to accommodate the loss of any one of these proteins. And so what we tested was the potential of crossing single mutant ATM um, R35X, so these are ATM knockout mice with a nonsense mutation with that of an APTX knockout mouse to create a double mutant that was deficient in both ATM as well as APTX to see whether loss of multiple proteins in this um, DNA repair pathway um, pathways uh, would induce an ataxic phenotype. And indeed, that's what we found. Here you can see two mice. The mouse on the left is a wild type, uh, well, is a wild type ATM on an APTX knockout background. And it's normal, walks no problem. And you'll see on the right that there's a severe ataxia at 400 days in the double mutant mouse, lacking both ATM and APTX expression. As you can see, this is not a mild phenotype. This is a, a mouse that has severe uh, deficits in its ability to coordinate its, its limbs. We find behavioral deficits in these mice as early as postnatal day eight, P8, um, using a postnatal writing reflex uh, ex experimental paradigm in which the mice are just laid, the little pups are laid on their back and we time them to see how long it takes them to flip over. This is um, in normal mice, takes relatively little time, a couple of seconds, and they're able to do it quickly. However, we found in both male and female mice um, a longer time to flip over and coordinate this um, reflexive movement. Um, in general, uh, AT it is not found to have differences between males and females. And across our examination of the, the mice, we also did not uh, identify any sex differences in the animal populations. And in many cases, we, you will see that we have combined um, our data across both male and female. The, however, after P8, the mice do um, grow and show relatively normal motor coordination. Um, at P30, we've assessed them in multiple behaviors, including the vertical pole assay that you saw above. And it's not until 200 days, um, after 200 days that the mice really begin to show uh, a deficit or a progressive decline in their motor coordination. And this is somewhat similar to that of AT patients in which an initial assessment or identification of an inability to progressive pro to progress from the sort of toddling to the correct and coordinated walking stages, patients normally patients usually don't show a major dramatic change in their motor coordination up until age five or so, even though they've got some deficits in which then there's a, usually a dramatic progression. Um, and decline in motor deficit. And so we see that here as well, although in this case it happens after postnatal day T100. And here I'll show you just how dramatic that is. You saw how poor the mouse um, was able to just move around as it was on a flat surface. And if we put them on the vertical pole, you can see that there's a significant reduction in their ability to climb down. And of course, we didn't put them all the way up at the top, uh, given their um, real severe loss of motor coordination, although they are able to, to move down small sections of it, although very slowly.
as you can see, this is not a mild deficit. This is a severe loss of motor coordination um, that progresses after postnatal day 200. We examine further the mouse's behaviors on a battery of different behavioral tests, which I've shown here. Along the left are the names of the different behavioral tests that we examined mice at both postnatal day 30 and postnatal day 400 in the purplish dark uh, side on the left um, are the wild type, and on the right are the double um, AT mutants. And as you can see, there aren't a lot of deficits that we can really detect uh, at postnatal day 30, although we do see maybe a deficit at, on the body position. And one can read this graph just by looking at the difference in the, the length of the bars left to right. And then the blue is male and the pink is female. At 400 days, we see a number of defects in the animals. Those that you could see just visually and those that we could measure as well, most of which are related to um, motor aspects of behavior. So we next wanted to understand if this loss of motor coordination, how um, the cerebellum um, was impacted in this. So of course, the in AT patients, there is a degeneration or an atrophy of the cerebellum. So we looked to see whether there was an atrophy in these mice as well. Um, and we did indeed find a developmental loss of the of cerebellar tissue in these mice. We looked at an, the ratio of the area of the cerebellum to that of the forebrain in order to normalize it to potential differences just in overall brain size. And you can see that we see a significant drop in the size of the cerebellum at P200 um, that continues on a little bit through uh, and past P400. I'm showing you here a number of different genotypes that have different amounts of either ATM or APTX, the purple being that of the wild type and then the orange uh, being that of the double mutant an expression of at least one copy of the ATM um, or the APTX uh, gene, although I'm not showing that one here, uh, is sufficient to alleviate the symptomology in these mice. And this is, suggests that if one was able to restore some of the ATM protein, um, that would probably have a, a major effect on these mice. We next wanted to look at the at what it was that was atrophying within the cerebellum. And we took a look at the cortex of the cerebellum. In particular, we measured the molecular layer and granule cell layer uh, of, the, of the cerebellar cortex. The molecular layer containing the Purkinje neuron dendrites, which is a primary cell within the cerebellar cortex. And what we found was that there were in we found in the wild type mouse uh, no change in the molecular layer width uh, across age. However, we did find a significant um, reduction in the Purkinje neuron in the Purkinje neuron dendritic layer, that molecular layer, uh, over time. And we found these effects across both the medial, intermediate, and lateral areas of the cerebellum. We did not find any change in the granule cell layer, suggesting that there is a relatively selective effect going on within the Purkinje neurons in the cerebellum. And so we decided to take a closer look to see whether there were physiological disruptions that were also going on within the Purkinje neurons. To do this, we examined uh, the electrophysiological, the properties of Purkinje neurons. Here we looked at their neural uh, their neural signaling, that is their act the action potentials that Purkinje neurons generate spontaneously. They're a little bit different than most other neurons that they will fire these action potentials at 40 to 120 hertz without any excitation. We did this by taking acute slices of the brain, having them um, incubated in an artificial cerebral spinal fluid, and then just took an, an extracellular electrode right up next to the Purkinje neuron and recorded the electrical impulses, which you can see in this purple and orange traces on the right here. In the wild type on the top, you can see that there's a, a fast 
set of action potentials. Each of those vertical lines is an action potential, and that the rate of these action potentials is significantly decreased in the double mutant. We found that this was developmentally regulated, although we found um, across the different regions, the lateral, intermediate, and medial, that the firing rate was reduced as early as um, P45, postnatal day 45, and that it did reduce um, significantly down at postnatal day 200 uh, into P400. And that expression of either ATM or APTX was sufficient to alleviate um, this phenotype, to prevent this phenotype. We then took a closer look to see what some of the biophysical properties were of the Purkinje neurons that might be disrupted and that could give rise to these changes in the neural signaling properties of the Purkinje neurons, that, that output signal of the Purkinje neurons. And so again, we did um, recordings in acute slices. In this case, we we're doing whole cell patch recordings um, using a voltage clamp method. And we can then it, use voltage steps to create current changes in the cell and uh, identify and examine specific uh, membrane properties. In particular, we looked at the membrane resistance, the membrane time constant, and the membrane capacitance. We found abnormal differences in the double mutant mice across all three of these metrics. And in particular, we did find a, almost a half, half the um, membrane capacitance in the double mutant mice and this means that the double mutant mouse Purkinje neurons are likely about have half the membrane of that of the, of the wild type. And this is consistent with a shrinking of the Purkinje neurons um, that would be consistent with the shrinking of the molecular layer with the Purkinje neuron dendrites and a predominant amount of their membrane is composed. We then also looked at synaptic inputs into the Purkinje neurons to look to see whether there was maybe dysregulation of other cells within the, in the cerebellar cortex. And consistent with the fact that the granule cell layer didn't show any um, loss in their width, we didn't find any uh, def defects in the synaptic inputs of uh, the granule cells to the Purkinje neurons. Here we looked at the mini excitatory postsynaptic currents. These are the currents that are just generated um, spontaneously from the granule cell parallel fiber synaptic endings onto the Purkinje neurons. And there are two traces here that you can see at the top, one in purple and one in orange. We didn't find any differences in the amplitude, the average amplitude of the um, currents. And this suggests that the granule cells are not showing any perturbations. We did, however, find a difference in the frequency, and this would suggest that there are actually twice as many granule cell inputs onto the Purkinje neurons, and this is an interesting finding that we hope to um, further investigate in the future. We also looked at the paired pulse facilitation, which is a normal response uh, of parallel fibers. So this is a short-term um, form of plasticity. If you stimulate the parallel fibers twice in short succession, in this case, this 50 milliseconds, the second pulse, the second current response is usually larger than the first. And we found no difference in the paired pulse facilitation in the granule cell uh, parallel fiber inputs onto the Purkinje neurons, which further supports the idea that the granule cell synaptic side, that presynapse in the granule cells, was normal. We did, however, find some abnormal uh, inputs from the climbing fiber, which is the other major input into the Purkinje neurons, and these differences suggest defects in the intrinsic calcium currents within the Purkinje neurons. The, in the case of climbing fibers, instead of paired pulse uh, facilitation, uh, one normally finds paired pulse depression, that is, is that the second current response to a double uh, stimulation of the axons to the climbing fibers results in a smaller current response rather than a larger one. And you can see that in the double mutant mice, the size of that second response is even smaller than that of the, the wild type. We, also, we did, however, find that the overall amplitude of what is really an all or none synaptic input from the climbing fibers was not different between the 
wild type and the double mutants, and this suggests that the climbing fiber synap uh, presynaptic side is normal. However, we did find significant differences in both the half width, the width, the half width, and the decay rate of the current in the climbing fibers. And this suggests that there's actually an intrinsic um, challenge in the calcium currents within the in the Purkinje neurons, um, as these that the currents that are recorded are predominantly mediated um, by calcium flux. These mice um, showed other characteristic uh, symptoms of AT. They showed reduced weight and survivability, and they also showed a high um, predilection and predisposition for cancer. Here I'm just showing the weight of the animals over age, and you can see that in the male, the double mutants are about half the weight by P200, and in females, they're about a third, they're about two thirds the weight of the um, control mice. Any mouse that lacks ATM at all, whether, whether or not there is any APTX, um, showed reduced survivability, that is, is that they had a predis predisposition, in this case, for cancer. Um, we, in these pie charts here, you can see that uh, the bottom three on the right there, which are all of the ATM deficient mice with no, with all, some, or no APTX, all had a high preponderance in the, the bluish gray um, uh, for developing a thymoma, uh, cancer in the thymus, and that in large part these um, thymomas were responsible for the 50% survival rate of the mice that you can see over on the left and the probability of survival in mice that lack the ATM protein. These mice also show immune defects, which I'm not going to talk about or tell you, show you any data on today, but they, these mice, um, for the first time, show the broad spectrum of characteristic symptoms of AT and thus um, provide us for the first time a mouse model to not only examine the underlying mechanisms that link ATM deficiency and APTX deficiency um, to cerebellar dysfunction and atrophy, but also as a potential tool to test therapeutic approaches um, and understand whether any potential therapies might have any therapeutic efficacy. And as of such right now, um, a major challenge within uh, the development of AT therapies has in part been that there's been no animal model with which to really test them before it gets um, to the clinic. So in conclusion, um, as I stated here just now, um, our novel mouse model of AT um, mouse model of AT deficient mice um, that lack both ATM and APTX um, develop a progressive and severe ataxia. The ataxia is associated with cerebellar atrophy resulting from progressive shrinkage of the dendritic length of the Purkinje neurons, and that the ataxia is also associated with abnormal neural activity and membrane properties of the Purkinje neurons. The synaptic inputs to Purkinje neurons appear relatively normal, but its response properties suggest um, defects in the intrinsic calcium currents and or homeostasis within Purkinje neurons. In the future, we're hoping to expand the analysis of the contributors to cerebellar atrophy um, to see whether other cells, not just the granule cells and the Purkinje neurons, may, that ju not just the Purkinje neurons are affected, it looks like the granule cells, which is the most predominant cell type in the cerebellar cortex, um, appear fine. We hope we will plan to look at the cerebellar nuclei as well as non-neuronal types of cells, glia, et cetera, like the Bergman glia. We plan to further define the abnormal Purkinje neuron properties and their implications on disrupting cerebellar output and those effects on control of motor coordination. Because of course, the uh, underlying ataxia here is unlikely generated by significant loss of Purkinje neurons as it doesn't look like they are dying off, but that they are dysfunctional, and that this dysfunction is changing the neural activity and output of the cerebellum, which is likely contributing to the, the motor defects. 
And finally, we look to elucidate the link between why DNA repair pathway proteins like ATM and APTX, when deficient in mice, uh, when deficient in mice and humans causes cerebellar defects and atrophy and resulting in ataxia. I'd like to thank the a number of people who have contributed to this project, um, in particular those uh, past and present who have worked in my lab. This includes Harvey, May, Jose, Martin, Kim, Callan, Jeannie, and Angelina, um, and several of my uh, collaborators uh, most notably, Tim Madranis and Michalina Iacovino. And I'd like to thank my funders, including the NINDS, the Lundquist Institute, and the CTSI at UCLA. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my talk, and um, I hope to hear from you soon uh, if you have any questions.